Why should an organization conduct a greenhouse gas inventory? Well, for a lot of organizations, they don't know what they don't know. You know, they're trying to understand where their emissions are coming from. There's real benefit in identifying where the risks are and understanding what are their potential hotspots. While doing so, they oftentimes identify and uncover cost savings. And you're able to respond to different stakeholder pressures once you've done your greenhouse gas inventory, whether that's coming from your customers, throughout your value chain, your shareholders, or even political or regulatory environments. So conducting your greenhouse gas inventory isn't just a nice thing to do because you care about the environment. It is an essential business opportunity because it helps you identify risks and identify and uncover cost savings while addressing your, your biggest environmental impacts all at the same time. So what are greenhouse gases? And I should say, this isn't gonna be an, a module that's full of science, but on the, on the very short and basic level, it's basically solar radiation that comes from the sun and then it's re-radiated heat back, but it gets trapped in our atmosphere and has a greenhouse gas effect of warming the planet. So what are the six greenhouse gases? The carbon dioxide, methane, perfluorocarbons, sulfur hexafluoride, nitrous oxide, and hydrofluorocarbons, or HFCs. There's a seventh greenhouse gas called soot, which is basically the black powdery stuff that you see coming out of smokestacks but it's typically not included in greenhouse gas uh, calculations because it doesn't stay up in the atmosphere very long. I talked about the greenhouse gases, but what does that all mean? Well, this number that I put up here, it's 350 parts per million. That's the globally recognized number in terms of atmospheric concentration that is safe for the human species on our planet. Every five years, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, does a report. It not only tracks what's the atmospheric concentration of CO2 equivalents in the atmosphere, but also says where are we and where do we need to be. Just recently in 2015, it was notified that we were at over 400 parts per million. And the goal is to get back down to 350 parts per million to reduce the amount of extreme weather events and to hopefully get greenhouse gas emissions under control. If you're wondering what that means in the overall context of these recent global agreements, there was an agreement in Paris at the end of you know, 2015 that 190 countries signed on to. And the goal is to keep temperatures you know, at or below 1.5 degrees Celsius increase. And that's basically trying to get to that 350 parts per million. Now, again, there's a longer term goal of between 2050 and 2100 of net zero emissions and they're gonna look at it. But basically, when they started with the Kyoto Protocol in you know, 1990, the goal was a 5% reduction off that 1990 level by 2012. But countries like the US and Australia never signed, China's emissions went through the roof. But you're finding that there was actually, across the globe, many people and many organizations and governments got behind this. And they actually reduced greenhouse gas emissions below 1990 levels. Unfortunately, it didn't get us to where we need to be. It does, it's not getting us to our 350 parts per million. So that's what the most recent global accord was trying to do, is to say, how can we look at where we are at 450 parts per million? How can we get down to a stabilized you know, planetary temperature and parts per million in the atmosphere in terms of greenhouse gas emissions? I mentioned the six greenhouse gases earlier, but to give you context, they all have different global warming potentials. And so you hear the term CO2 or carbon or carbon footprint, really what they're talking about is that's all shorthand for CO2 equivalents or carbon dioxide equivalents because since all of these six different greenhouse gases have different global warming potentials, they have to find some way of normalizing them. So they look at what say CO2 is and then methane is 25 times more potent than that. You start looking at things like perfluorocarbons or sulfur hexafluoride or nitrous or hydrofluorocarbons, and they all are way more potent than CO2. So rather than giving someone like, hey, here's what your greenhouse gas inventory is and you're this, 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 this for all of them, they take everything and, and normalize them on the global warming potential and put it in a CO2 equivalence so you can get one number that people can understand. 